uh, times like no other times, and I know that's been said uh, probably before, but let's face it, there's a convergence of events on the world and in our nation that's really never happened before. And, you know, people who doubted Bible prophecy 10, 20 years ago, and there are still vast numbers of our brothers and sisters in Christian churches, I think it's 70% of churches, uh, don't, um, either they don't allow the teaching of Bible prophecy in their churches. And at that note, it, I get fired up, so I'm going to have to put a comma there and just say something about that. And I know you've probably heard me say that before. But just think about this for a moment. God's Word is the inspired, inerrant Word of God, supernaturally authored by God, supernatural authorship. This book is a holy book. It's not a holy book among other holy books. It is the holiest of book, and it's above all books, not because I say so or you say so, because the author of this book proved the fact that he was God by resurrecting from the dead. All the, other, all the other authors of the so-called great spiritual books are all in the grave. So if we're checking out on the author's credibility, he resurrected from the dead. It's not even a close race. And it proves the truthfulness of the Word of God. And when Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man comes to the Father but through me, the reasons that that is true is because, of course, Jesus said it was true, but he proved it by resurrecting from the dead, and he is also going to prove it by coming back again as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, another thing about the Word of God is that Jesus is the Word become flesh. So the Word of God is God. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word became flesh. Or we read Genesis, where God spoke, and He created the earth, and He created mankind. So the Word is not only authored by God supernaturally, but Word is God. It's alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, right? That means Genesis from Revelation. So if I was, and I am a licensed minister of Paradise Mountain Church, so this is kind of like a rhetorical question. But if I was a minister or somebody called to preach the gospel as, as a lay person or, or somebody who's in the full-time ministry, everybody's in the full-time ministry, by the way. You all know that, right? You know, God doesn't look down from heaven and have categories. Full-time ministry, part-time ministry, we're all in the full-time ministry. We just have different ministries. So... How is it that 70% of evangelical, that used to mean Bible-believing, churches now censor the preaching and teaching of Revelation and other prophetic scriptures throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament? Now think about that for a moment. These ministers, these denominations, these churches, these leaders, these Christians are making a decision with their finite mind that they are smarter than God because they are sitting in the seat of the scoffer, as the Bible says. They're sitting in a seat in judgment upon God's Word. And they have decided with... Think about this. They have decided with their finite minds. Their minds are about the size of a pea, and I'm being really generous com compared to God's infinite mind. Not even a pea compared to infinity of intelligence. So why would somebody with a pea brain um, decide in their finite wisdom that Bible prophecy uh, is not a good thing to teach? It might scare people away from Jesus or that we're not going to talk about the Old Testament prophecies, or we're not going to talk about the role of Israel, or we're not going to talk about the Antichrist or the book of Revelation, and so on and so forth, right? They make a decision with their finite minds to censor the Word of God. Now, that is stupidity on an astronomical scale. And I'm being kind. That is, 
I'm not, I, this, I, you know, I'm trying to be delicate because I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, no. No, I'm not trying to be delicate. I'm trying to be truthful. Because my goal, by the way, is not to please you. I am not a seeker-friendly minister. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, I'm not here to alienate you, okay? I want to present the gospel in a way that is appealing, that you can understand, but I'm not going to change the contents of the gospel to please you. Did Jesus change the contents of the Bible to please people? No. He got crucified for it. So what, where does the seeker model come from? You know, I'll tell you, you know what? It's just going to be one of these days where the rubber meets the road, pedal to the metal, and let the chips fly where they may, and trust God, and full speed ahead. The, the Lucifer rejected the Word of God. And he tempted Adam and Eve to reject the Word of God. The rejection of God's Word is the fundamental sin. It caused the fall of man, and it allowed Satan to be the temporary ruler of this world. So when modern ministers reject the Word of God, they're committing the same sin that Lucifer enticed Adam and Eve to uh, commit. And number two is, they're depriving people from the truth, and they're censoring God's Word. So we have a pea brain telling the infinite God that your Word, I'm going to censor it. Now that doesn't work on any level. It doesn't work on a spiritual... In addition, what they're actually doing is they're taking a knife or a blunt instrument and they're, excuse the bluntness, hacking apart the body of Christ afresh. Because if, you're, if Jesus is the Word become flesh and you're ripping chapters out of the Bible, you're ripping Jesus to pieces. You understand? It's an assault on the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Not teaching the entire truth from Genesis to, Genesis to Revelation is an assault on the kingdom of God. And there is a model for who assaulted the kingdom of God. That's Lucifer, who is leading a third of the angels in a rebellion against the throne room of God. That is rebellion against God's throne room, conducted by churches. That is the heart of the matter. Now, even from an earthly matter, there's no filmmaker or novelist or book, and you certainly wouldn't read one, where, you know, they begin with chapter one, and then whole chapters are missing, and then finally, you know, they rip out the last third of the book. Would you read or go say, of course you wouldn't. It doesn't make sense on any level, because Genesis does not make sense without Revelation, and the message of Christ's salvation and death on the cross and his ascension does not make sense without Revelation. It's total madness. So this assault on the throne room of God is the centrality of Babylon or the Babylonian system. Because the Babylonian system, and I'll talk about this uh, as we move on. Um, we have a new book out called The Babylon Code, with the risk of putting it up, but it's coming out October 6th uh, with my co-author Troy Anderson. The, the message, and we're going to revisit it in this session, in the book of Genesis, we read about Babylon. Let's just read it, because this is an interfacing between rejecting the Word of God and Babylon in the modern churches. If we go to Genesis 11, starting at verse 1, it says, Now the whole earth had one language and one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. And they some said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to, the whole, to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built, and the Lord said, indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language, and this is what they will begin to do. Now, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. So, it appears to be through human eyes, just like it appears to be through human eyes that we should censor the Word of God to make it more appealing to people, 
That, that to man's wisdom, that sounds good. The same people who are um, uh, embracing the seeker-friendly approach would also uh, uh, embrace the Nimrod's uh, method of uh, unification and globalism. The world is one, like John Lennon sang, and the world will be as one, and they have one language, and they are working together in unity. It sounds great, right? It's what's, what's happening right now. Ancient Babylon. And in the Babylon Code, ancient Babylon returns in Revelation in the last day. So it all sounds good. They're cooperating. But the Lord could see the intent of their heart, and the intent of their heart is they wanted to be God, and the purpose of ancient Babylon, among other things, was to be a rebellion against the throne room and the kingdom of God, and therefore God judged it by scattering their languages, confusing the language, and scattering them across the earth. Now, God did not read, I mean, God did not put in the account of the Tower of Babel, which is preached in almost no seeker-friendly type churches or evangelical churches. It's hopscotched over. God didn't put it in there because he was bored. There's a vital message for the times that we live in and the end times in the account of Babylon. And Babylon and the Tower of Babel uh, literally comes from the word gate of the gods. Who were these gods? What kind of gate? Well, the Tower of Babel um, is an interdimensional technological stargate which allowed for the entry of interdimensional beings or fallen angels. It was an instrument of technology. Now, we explain that in the book, The Babylon Code, in detail. And uh, before I pursue that line of thought, I just want to tell you that this is not, you know, that could be really heavy for somebody to hear the first time out of the gate, what I just said. It's kind of like some heads would spin, some people would be incredibly skeptical. But what if I said I could prove it? What if I said I could document everything that I just said from the Word of God and give you what I believe would be an irrefutable argument? The Tower of Babel was an interdimensional star stargate. It was a portal. Nimrod built it, and he had DNA that was not purely human, and he built the Tower of Babel as a worship tower to worship the host of heaven. So it was uh, an astrological worship tower that had to do with ancient astrological occult religions. And somebody's playing a thing there. It reminds me of confusion in the Tower of Babel. I'm speaking, and an electronic device is speaking. It's probably Surrey giving a competing message. Drive five miles to, you know. I'm not intelligent enough to be able to talk to Surrey. Uh, I have the competitor's brand, and I don't know, even know, I know what her name is because I wrote about it in a book. I don't even know how to use it. So maybe you can teach me. <laughs> we got lost coming back from the restaurant. I, I wasn't the driver, by the way. And we had two other men, both who had GPS. One finally managed to get theirs on. My wife can get hers on. She's got some new app that's, wow, tells you if there's a police officer there. It tells you if there's a tire in the road. You know, it's great. I just don't know how to use it. But she said to me a funny thing. She said, you know, if you yell in the car like you're having an argument, this device will be silent. It'll stop talking. It'll listen. No, it listens. And then after the argument's over, it'll come back to talking. You think that's an accident? Okay. So Babylon, technological stargate, gate of the gods. Let's go back before the flood, and let's establish another fact, that the flood of Noah must be understood properly. Uh, rightly divide the word of God. The Bible doesn't say unrightly divide the word of God. It says rightly divide the word of God. So the flood of Noah has to be understood in its proper context. The flood of Noah was a targeted DNA judgment. It was a DNA judgment, a digital judgment, a holographic judgment, and most of all, a genetic judgment. All right? Now, I can see people having problems with that statement. And I know there's a lot of free marijuana in Boulder, man, because we went to the thing and... I 
I told the guys in the room, it was a sarcastic joke, so I don't think it was really a temptation. It's not a temptation. Uh, I gave that up a long time ago. Many moons ago. So I said, I said you should tell them that Paul McGuire went to the, uh, one of these uh, marijuana places, bought himself, uh, uh, I knew what it was 15 minutes ago, a hookah pipe and some marijuana, and he's up in his hotel room, and all we hear is Jimi Hendrix pounding music, and we smell the smoke under the door. So can you please pray for our brother Paul uh, that he wouldn't back? That's a joke, so lighten up, okay? <laughs> I have a sarcastic sense of humor, and I don't intend to apologize about it either. Okay? Like I said, I'm not seeker friendly. You either like me or you hate me, and if you hate me, guess what? You've got to pray till you love me or you're out of the, walking out of the will of God. Now, if you're honest and you're married or divorced or whatever, according, you've had practice in hating somebody and then having to play, uh, pray that the love of God would shine in your heart, right? Amen. There'd be 100% amen, and if there's not 100% amen, we've got a big problem with lying here, and I'll do an altar call. So we know it was a DNA-targeted judgment. Why? Because we have been told for years, well, the judgment of the floods of Noah was just because of the wickedness of man. Yes, it was because of the wickedness of man. But that's only part of it. God is good. God is love. God is just. God is fair. So if God is judging the mankind through a flood, which he was, why did he also judge the animal species and the other species? He wiped all the animal species out and the other species. Is God like a bad shot? You know, he's aiming to, to turkey hunt. I'm from the city. I don't know nothing about turkey hunting. Okay? And, and, and he doesn't hit the turkey. He hits every, you know, the goose laid the golden egg. This is getting really weird. Maybe I did stop in and have a hookah pipe session. <laughs> so, so he wiped out the animal species. That tells us the judgment was designed and targeted to... To, to eradicate the corrupted DNA in the animal and other species as well as the human species. Okay? If you don't get that, I can't help you, and I'm not giving you a refund because it's not my conference. And I don't think they should give you a refund either. I think that they should give you a good swift kick in the posterior. I told you I wasn't seeker friendly. So maybe I am like that guy with the, the bad dog, mad dog fixer. So, the Noah, the ark contains the animals, two by two. Now, any, any first grader can get this concept, or third grader. Two by two, the animals, male and female. What does that tell you? Well, tell, it's for the purpose of reproduction. Noah and his uh, sons and their wives, they had purified DNA. So God wiped out all the species, replenished the earth with pure DNA. It's a DNA story. So what corrupted the human DNA? Well, we know earlier in the account of, before the account of the flood, the, the Benai Elohim, or the uh, sons of God, looked upon human women with favor, had sexual relationships with them, and produced the hybrid offspring race of the Nephilim, which are soulless creatures that have the DNA in them of fallen angels. Okay? So that's why God, and he said, well, what about the animals? Well, I, I, I want to be respectful. Levi there's a reason why the Levitical laws are there. Remember that demons need host bodies. When, when Jesus was preaching the gospel and he cast demons out of people, they went into a bay of pigs or whatever, but they wanted to be in a host body. Remember that Lucifer, when he was seducing uh, uh, Adam and Eve, he was in an upright reptilian body. So, if these fallen angels were trying to gain access into the earth, they needed bodies. So they were experimenting um, genetically with the animal species. All right? Now, that may be hard to, uh, pill to swallow, but you know what? If you're sick, you need to take the pill. Depends what kind of pill. I wouldn't re recommend taking the vaccine. This is a very awkward silence here. You probably all took the vaccine. <laughs> If you took the vaccine, we'll, we'll pray for you. I'm not taking it because I didn't join the uh, Jim Jones uh, Kool-Aid cult, right? I prefer antioxidants to, to vaccines. Okay, where everything but the kitchen sink is, is thrown is the vaccine. 
You don't know what you're getting shot up with. Oh, you think it's a pneumonia uh, um, injection to keep you from getting pneumonia? You think it's to stop the flu and the colds? How do you know that? How do you know what is in that chemical serum, in that needle that they're firing into your system? How do you know what you're taking? Well, I wouldn't just get fired up by some pharmaceutical company with an agenda called euthanasia, right? You want to co control the cost of health care? Euthanasia. Now, so, Mount Hermon, but relatively near Israel, when we read the book of Jude, we read the account. We normally would not read the book of Enoch because Enoch is considered an extra-biblical book. And therefore, we don't place extra-biblical books in the same authority as the biblical books, the Old Testament and New Testament. But in the book of Jude, God is giving us permission to take a look at Enoch regarding a specific subject. And that was the angels that were placed in chains for everlasting judgment for going after strange flood. So when we read Enoch, we read the account of how 200 fallen angels descended upon Mount Hermon, mated with human women, produced the race of the Nephilim, but it also says they imparted technology to men and women. That's very important. The fallen angels... Um, gave mankind technology. That's why we see the remnants archaeologically uh, all over the world with the Egyptian pyramids and um, the pyramids underwater, the Incan ruins, the Mayan ruins, so on and so forth, of these huge monolithic structures that were built and we could not build them today. We don't have the power and science and technology to move the stones and assemble them with that precision as they did back then. So the, this, they, there were super races before the flood. And I think there was a population of probably three billion people before the flood of Noah. Now, why is that important? You're, you're going uh, down a, a strange trail. No, I'm not. Because Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. So obviously this is important to Jesus and it's a sign of the last times. What did Jesus mean? Well, most people used to think, well, it just meant the wickedness and violence on the earth and God judged it. Yes, that's true. But it also means the primary judgment, which was genetic. The primary judgment was genetic. Because God doesn't kill an entire, all the animals on planet earth for sport. The target was the corrupted fallen angel DNA. And so God had to destroy it and start the earth over again. So Jesus said, referring to the last days, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. So isn't it interesting that in our lifetime, we now have transhumanism, artificial immortality, cyborgs, androids, robots, biotechnology, Ray Kurzweil of Google, uh, uh, Department of Defense super soldiers, genetically enhanced, uh, you know, I do research wherever I go. I'm always doing research. Um, and I pray, and uh, the Lord leads me into the, the, just these weird, uncanny places, like I was up in the mountains somewhere uh, very recently, and I happened to walk into a high, high biotech uh, technology convention. And uh, I've never been one to pay attention to whether the meeting was private or public. I just walked in so and began to read the charts and the literature, and I began to realize that uh, all these biotechnology uh, scientists were coming from major think tanks and universities and laboratories from all over the nation to meet. And I was reading about how they were using the uh, DNA of snails and insects and fish and everything else. Then they're breeding, interbreeding it with, not interbreeding it, they're, they're mixing it with human DNA. It's, it's the norm right now, okay? But there are rumors, of course, that, they're all, that, that the, the uh, classified military uh, defense operations are mixing it with um, uh, Nephilim DNA. I can't prove that. I haven't been in one of those bases. If I was, I'd probably be dead with a little tomb. Not a tomb, a little little cross on the highway, outside of Highway 51. There lies Paul McGuire. May he rest in peace. They have birds out in the desert? What, what are they called? Uh, <laughs> 
So there'd be a bu- bu- bunch of vultures surrounding on my uh, grave. But that doesn't matter. Be absent with the body is be present with the Lord. I don't care. Do you think I care what my gravestone looks like? Do you think I give a hoot about what my gravestone looks like? I don't, even, I don't give it any thought at all. Because the only thing I am concerned about is that when I face the great, not the, excuse me, when I face the judgment seat of Christ, that I have done things out of purity of heart and, and selflessness and out of pure worship for Jesus, that, that the substance of my life will not burn up as wood, hay, and stubble at the judgment seat of Christ. And I will be rewarded for stuff that I really did for Jesus, not for my ego, not for myself, or all the other carnal reasons. You, you want the same thing, right? Because it would be a nightmare. Amen. You should applaud the Lord. It would be a nightmare to be at the judgment seat of Christ and everything burns in your life because it was all done for ego, self, self self-gratification, and and everything you've done in your entire lifetime is just, you're you're watching it. You don't lose your salvation because you're saved by grace. You're going to go right into heaven, okay? But you're watching the sum total of your life is the equivalent of putting a piece of toast in the microwave and turning it on for an hour and a half. Now, I haven't done that, but I have a theory of what it would look like. <laughs> okay, but the Bible says um, you, the Lord will rescue you as at like a man out of a burning building, take you into heaven. But there's going to be agony. You're going to, I hate to say it, it's, you're going to like scream and yell and be in torment, not for eternally, eternity, God forgives you, but because you, you blew your, your gift in life. Everybody's got a gift of life, right? Okay, so... Babylon. It's very interesting that all the the present economic system that we're seeing rise in the world, it's no longer theoretical. We are seeing um, the rise of a global government, a global economic system, and a global uh, religion right now before our eyes, never faster than before. This is the return of ancient Babylon. That's what we deal with in our book, The Babylon Code, because the dynamics that happen in Babylon are happening again in our lifetime. I would suggest to you that if we look at the uh, what's called Eurasia, which would be uh, Europe, uh, Asia, and the Middle East, and we start up there in Russia, and we go to the Ukraine, and then we go into the European Union, and then we go down there to Syria, and Iraq, and Iran, and Israel, and the Middle East, and all those nations, and China, um, that the real reason uh, behind the, the military struggle, yeah, there's racial, uh, uh, not ra- well, yeah, there's racial and ethnic wars, and there's uh, uh, religious wars. But also, uh, our dollar is no longer an- anchored to gold. It's anchored to oil. So the power of the dollar is contingent upon us and the European Union control, controlling the flow of the world's oil. So that's what's really going on behind the scenes in all these conflicts. Now, another thing to pay attention to is that the BRICS nations, which include nations like uh, Russia, China, and India, and so forth, they're coming up with competing world currencies and their, their desire to topple the dollar and replace it with SDRs, special drawing rights, and a basket of currencies, which simply means a collection of competing world currencies which will eventually become the new world currency. I believe there's a new world currency being hidden in the background of the world right now, waiting for the right chaos, because remember that everything you see around you in this earth, whether it's chaos in our nation or chaos in the globe, I want to ask you a question. Is this chaos globally, or is this chaos in the United States the product of just chance situations, or are there highly trained, very powerful individuals and groups that are orchestrating the chaos to bring in their new order? And I would suggest to you that it is of paramount importance to understand that in the system of Babylon, which culminates in Revelation 17 and 18, commercial Babylon and economic Babylon, that there are very powerful men and women in groups that 
control the economic system, that control wars, that control riots, that control the media. Six corporations control the media. Just six. Six. Do you think you, we have a free media in the United States? No. That's why they're playing sneaky little games. Lots of sneaky little dirty games. I call them Manchurian news candidates, Manchurian conservative radio talk show hosts. Some of the people you think that are great conservatives are bought and paid for and are about as conservative as, uh, well, I don't want to say something. But um, they're not who they seem to be. Okay? There is a government behind the government. The people who pretend to be the leaders are puppets, and there is a shadow government in place in the United States and in Europe and across the world. We documented it in the Babylon Code. We believe the book is a historic book because it's not that people haven't written about this topic before, because they have. And it's not that people have not integrated it with Bible prophecy. They have. But we believe that what we wrote in this book, we couldn't have published a year ago. There would have been too much resistance, especially in the Christian community, as it being conspiracy theories, and you know, you're talking about secret societies like Bilderberg, Bohemian Grove, Skull and Bones, Illuminati, uh, too much resistance in the Christian community. But times have changed because of uh, social media and the internet. There's a whole lot of Christians and a whole lot of people around the world that are getting smart, and they realize, well, gee, Bilderberg really is a secret, powerful group with Nazi origins. That can be documented. One of the things about the Babylon Code is my co-author, uh, Troy Anderson, is a Pulitzer Prize-nominated journalist, and extensive documentation from mainstream sources to prove the existence of the Bilderberg Group, Bohemian Grove, which I was uh, walking around in, uh, in San Francisco, not participating in the ceremony, by the way. Uh, uh, and I only went so far because I really wanted to live. But they have a big owl statue, and all the presidents go there, even big conservative presidents. I could name probably your favorite and maybe my favorite uh, conservative president. He, what was he doing at Bohemian Grove? All right? The, the, the decision to, to manufacture the atomic bomb, the Manhattan Project, was made at Bohemian Grove with Robert Oppenheimer, the uh, physicist who was in charge of the Manhattan Project. And presidents and military leaders, they gather there to get drunk. Allegedly, they have sexual orgies there. And they do offer effigies of human babies, which are like, I guess, dolls or fake babies or whatever. And they put them on the hands of Moloch, or excuse me, this giant owl, which is Moloch from the Old Testament, pagan god where the ancient Israelites and the Canaanites would sacrifice their babies and burn them alive and worship, why, even, why would they do that even as a joke? It's not a joke. Do you think it's funny to burn a baby in a joke ceremony and get bombed? I don't think it's funny. I think it's sick. So if you're that sick to think it's funny to burn babies to an effigy of, uh, of, of babies to the god of Moloch, you think that's cute, uh, I, I think that reveals the sickness that could be far deeper than most of us would want to examine and explain the existence of skull and bones. What's skull and bones? It's a symbol of death. Uh, see, I'm a very skeptical researcher, by, by the way. Almost everything that I'm teaching you and everything that I write about, and I've written 26 books, um, is I was skeptical. I didn't believe every time I came to a truth, I didn't believe it. So take every major point that I made regarding various subjects this morning, uh, I didn't believe any of it. I had to have proof. And the Area 51 websites just don't cut it for me. I need documented proof. All right? So the Illuminati, which does exist, but I can't tell you the war I've had with the Christian, not me personally, but any individual who tries to talk about the truth of the Illuminati, that does exist. That does exist. But evangelical Christians today don't think that the same ones that don't believe in Bible prophecy, they don't think the Illuminati exists. They don't think Bilderberg, they don't, they don't think all this exists. You know, I have a, I have a, a definition for their perception. It might be carnal. I, I, may, I may need to repent. At the present moment, I'm not sure whether it's carnal or spiritual. 
so I'm just going to go for it and may have to repent privately in my bedroom while I'm burning my hookah pipe that I never unpacked. <laughs> but I would say the perception that these secret societies don't exist is, uh, should I be diplomatic or should I, should I be gracious, evangelical, <laughs> diplomatic, or truthful? I'm going to be truthful. Because I don't want to be evangelical. That sounds like you got a disease. He became an evangelical. I'm, I'm big into like perception and, and the way a word sounds. I mean, no offense. I don't mind saying I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I don't mind saying I'm a Christian. I have trouble with the word evangelical because it sounds like you got a disease. One of these, you know, 16,000 different STDs. That's a sarcastic joke, sorry. Okay, so it's somewhat of a moronic perception, and it's a perception based on total ignorance. And every time I've ever had a debate with anybody who says these organizations or what you're saying is not true, every single time I've had a debate, and I've challenged people, if you come on the air with me, they never come, uh, um, they have spent five minutes doing their homework. I've spent 40 years. Now, you could say I spent 40 years because I got lost in the wilderness. But it's been about 40 years. Actually, I began my research in third grade. No, no, no kidding. Because I um, read Aldous Huxley's book, Brave New World, in 1984 in third grade, and got it and fully understand it. And I wasn't safe. So uh, they were talking about these future totalitarian societies, the one that's being erected before our very eyes, a Babylon, a technological Babylon. So they don't believe these societies exist. Now. Let's look at our founding fathers. Let's look at the great men of God who were there at the birth of America, like the father of the first spiritual awakening, Jonathan Edwards, who knew Greek, Hebrew, Latin, studied 12 hours a day. And do you know what? In the, in the mid-1700s, he published two thick manuscripts with the word atomic physics in them. This was a bright guy. His sons and grandsons went on to be the, he was the first president, I believe, of Yale. And then his grandson uh, became the president of Yale. Brilliant guy, also a brilliant intellectual, fervent Christian. And you know what his grandson did? And we quoted in the Babylon Code. He, he preached a sermon warning American Christians about the dangers of the Illuminati. That was his whole sermon delivered at Yale University. Now contrast this with the Bozo the Clown Club today that doesn't believe the Illuminati exists. Who has more intellectual, spiritual credibility? The guys who really did their homework and studied and God used in a powerful way? Or the uh, prancing ballerinas of political correctness? Who's got more cre credibility? Even our founding fathers, like George Washington, warned about the Illuminati. The other founding fathers warned about the Illuminati. Franklin, Benjamin Franklin was in the Illuminati. They all knew it existed. How come this clueless crowd that preaches the seeker-friendly gospel? Now, I'm going to get real down and not dirty, truthful. Okay? Because... I'm just in one of these, I believe it's a Holy Spirit-inspired mood because I pray before. I pray before I speak. It doesn't mean, you know, I'm not the inspired Word of God. It doesn't mean I can't miss it. But i got to follow the burning in my heart as I believe that it lines up with the truth of God's Word. And the truth of God's Word is a sword, not a uh, daffodil. I got over my daffodil days when I was smoking real dope as a hippie and had long hair. So I'm not here to give you a sunflower that you can put in your hair. I'm here to give you the sword of truth. No, not to cut you and no, no, not, not to circumcise you so don't get like paranoid. That was a joke, guys, about the circumcision. I have really no desire whatsoever to even remotely even think about that statement, okay? That, that can give you a hint on my orientation and that's all we need to say. So, <clears throat> they don't want to deal with the truth. Now, yet, yet, when you study the sermons of some of these men, and they're intelligent men, and I really struggle in my heart because I hear them preach the gospel, 
And I'm not their judge, but I can only judge the content. I can't judge their hearts. So I'm really struggling about some of these men. Some of these men, I believe, are apostate. All right? They're flat-out apostate. Some of these men I struggle about. Okay? I agonize. I pray for them. Now, but when your message that you're communicating to the world is bullet point after bullet point of almost exactly the bullet point after bullet point of the United Nations program, except you change just a few words, and you go down the list, and this particular plan is right out of the United Nations handbook, and the United Nations is built for one reason, to bring about a global government. It was financed by Rockefeller and the globalists to bring in a one-world government. The Council on Foreign Relations exists to bring in a one-world government. These groups are connected to secret societies. You may not want to believe that, we, ha we have documentation. You've probably come across your own documentation. So, how is it these pastors can reject revelation? How can they reject the prophets? How can they reject the words of Jesus and replace it with United Nations dogma? That's evil, man. And this, some of these guys are intelligent. So, you know, I have real problem uh, um, not uh, believing they don't understand that they've made a deal with the devil. Okay, now maybe they're rationalizing. Again, I can't judge their hearts. I really can't. Maybe they think this is the way of, of uh, uh, bringing the gospel into dark places. That may be what they think. But as I was telling my wife in a long discussion, uh, she wishes my discussions weren't so long because it's essentially a five-hour monologue. Um, she would tell me for years you need to get your own radio talk show. I eventually did become a radio talk show for 10 years, four hours live on a day. So, I mean, I could talk all day long, and I'm sure you don't want to hear me all talk all day. What is this, man? I'm going to take a hammer and smash your cell phone, then repent later. It was a joke, joke. I know that cost you big bucks. But if I run over a car, you know, just let's not get segue here with my carnality. So where was I? I totally lost my train of thought. Okay, their motives, their hearts. Okay, so, so the question has to be asked. They're preaching United Nations dogma, and they're rejecting the Word of God, and they have a seeker-friendly gospel. Now the question is, if you have the Holy Spirit inside you, and every believer in Jesus Christ has the Holy Spirit inside them at the time of salvation, Yet, we're still commanded to walk in the Spirit. And I'm not here to push a particular, uh, uh, you know what, I despise theological debates. Uh, theology is important. Doctrine is very important. But for, I have a purpose. And for, for this purpose, I simply want to say, if somebody has the Holy Spirit living inside them, which you do at the time of salvation, and you're renewing your mind with the Word of God, which is truth, and you have the spirit of truth living inside you, and you're renewing your mind with the Word of God, and your ultimate authority is always the Word of God, never experience, because we can be deceived by experiences. My heart would grieve reading these sermons crafted from United Nations page after page after page of the text of United Nations material and translated into sermons being preached on Sunday morning. My heart would grieve. I couldn't sleep at night. The Holy Spirit would give me no rest. The spirit of truth would give me no rest if I preached false doctrine. In fact, if I commit a sin that I'm aware of and God convicts me of it, it's an awful thing to be a Christian and commit sins and then God deals with you. Why did I say that? Why did I do that? Why did I? You, you've been there, right? You got this, that's why you know you're a child of God. You've got the spirit of God in you. So how is it and this is where the axe is going to be laid to the root. How is it that men and women of God in America, how is it that 70% of the evangelical churches in America, can we talk about abortion, which is a sin, and our nation is given over to such a depraved mind that they bargain for body parts and intact bodies like they were selling cell phones on an open market? Anybody who does not have a reprobate mind 
You want to vomit because your guts are destroyed. Your emotions are destroyed by horror of what they're doing. It's the same spiritual deception and horror that came down upon the Nazis who were able to incinerate Jews and then go drink fine wine and listen to classical music. It's hideous. And you want to prance around like a ballerina being politically correct. Like you're the host of a TV game show. I'm not the host of a TV game show. I'm here to talk about truth. So, the spirit of truth would convict me about apostasy and spiritual deception. The spirit of truth would say, Paul, you are being unfaithful. You're not teaching my people revelation or the other prophetic scriptures. Paul, you didn't stand for Israel. And my word specifically says in the Abrahamic covenant, those that bless Israel will be blessed and those that curse Israel will be cursed. I stand up for Israel all the time publicly. I get tremendous waves of hostility and rage and anger, a lot from Christians uh, who, who uh, have been taught spiritual deception. Now, why do I do that? I do that because the Spirit of God compels me to. It compels me to. See, at the end of the day, I have to be able to sleep on my pillow with a clean conscience. I can't be, excuse the word, but I'm, I'm going to say a whore. I can't be a spiritual whore. Now, Babylon means many things. Some people think America is Babylon. I believe uh, that's partially correct, not totally correct. That's just my opinion. I'm not here to argue with you about it. It also represents an occultic world system that began at the Tower of Babel with Nimrod and his wife, Semiramis, which was the fountainhead of the mystery religions and all the occult teachings. And it was the establishment of what I call the Pharaoh God King system of government and economics, where you have a slave class, a managerial class, and a ruling class like the Illuminati that believe they're gods. The highest levels of our society today, there exists a hidden elite that are actually worshiping Lucifer and following his directive. If we take the Bible seriously, we shouldn't have a problem with that because the Bible tells us Lucifer is the temporary god of this world. And in the book of Ephesians, the apostle Paul says, for our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and the dark unseen forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Those are spiritual beings. Those are demonic forces. They are at work in this world, along with God's angels and the armies of God, the heavenly armies of God, and the angelic forces. And there are people in very powerful places who are administrating Lucifer's will through economy, through politics, through secret societies. You see, the reason for secret societies is they had to transmit the occult technology the occult power secrets and the occult teachings from system to system, from Babylon to Egypt to Rome to Greece to Europe to the United States to the EU today, they had to secretly transmit that information. And because of the uh, proliferation of Christianity until recently, um, they kind of had to hide it. That's why they have secret societies, because they didn't want to be uh, uh, brought to jail or you know, investigated. So. These societies exist. Now, if my, the evangelical church is not teaching the Word of God and they're rejecting the Word of God, and I know I've said this at several conferences here, but it has to be repeated. If you have received Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior, if you're born again, you are in the body of Christ. The body of Christ is a supernatural body of Christ of which Jesus Christ is the head. You are not only the bride of Christ, but the body of Christ. You are going to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb with Jesus. It doesn't mean, men, you're going to be feminized. It simply means, for spiritual purposes, you are considered part of the bride of Christ and the body of Christ. That's supposed to be, by the blood of Jesus and by faith, pure and holy. Holiness does not come through self-effort. Holiness comes by faith and faith alone, and the Spirit of God producing obedience in you, and you 
cooperating with the move of the Spirit of God as He tries to, or not tries to, as He will sanctify you with His Word and with His Spirit. You don't perfect yourself. In contrast, men and women and Christians who rejected the Word of God, the Apostle Paul calls the rejection of the Word of God and false doctrine, he defines that as spiritual adultery or spiritual fornication. Now, if the bride of Christ, or the body of Christ in America specifically, is involved in spiritual fornication and um, spiritual adultery because they're rejecting the Word of God and they're uh, disobeying the Word of God, then has not those that claim to be part of the body of Christ become a harlot or a whore? If they're being unfaithful and fornicating with the spirit of the world, they're acting like whores or harlots, right? All right? So that would put them, perhaps, more in the camp of Babylon, the mother of harlots. Because Semiramis, Nimrod's wife, was a whore, by the way. And the spiritual system that will arise in the last days as a counterfeit to Christianity, this global religion, where all ways lead to heaven, is a lie. It's part of the one world government of the false prophet that causes people to worship the Antichrist. It's Luciferian in nature, and it is called Babylon, Mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots. The kings of the earth fornicated with her. Okay? So, we live in a time where there is phenomenal, major, cataclysmic change and convergence in our lifetime, as never before. I mean, we see men who get sex, you know, super athletes who now adorn the pages of the media and with magazines and they become women. I mean, anything goes now, man. It's crazy and it's off the charts. Anything. It's totally nuts out there. All right? And it's going to intensify. The only way, but see, in the middle of this, this intensification, of the chaos. By the way, the chaos is important because in these secret societies, they have an expression. It's order out of chaos, or new world order out of chaos. You have to have social chaos, economic chaos, or manufactured crisis. You have chaos to bring in a new world order. The new world order, or the global order, is a counterfeit of the kingdom of God. And Babylon in the Old Testament, the Tower of Babel, was a counterfeit of the kingdom of God. That's why God judged it. We're moving to a time where the world is racing to embrace an antichrist. The spirit of antichrist, small s, has invaded America already. And it's causing bizarre behavior. So, what is our responsibility as Bible-believing Christians until the return of the Lord? God has not abandoned us. He has promised to deliver us, just like He has prom promised to deliver Israel. And when they followed Him, He delivered them. God supernaturally delivered Israel over and over again. Despite their uh, shortcomings, God's going to deliver Israel in the relatively near future. Not based on its perfection, based on God's everlasting covenant with the physical descendants of Abraham. God's covenant with you and I is based on the blood of Jesus Christ and faith. It's not based on our perfection. We don't enter heaven because we're perfect. We enter heaven because we have faith in the finished work of Christ. And Jesus lets us be born again and sanctifies us and saves us. He's the author and finisher of our salvation. What is required of us is faith. So how do we stand strong in the last days? We, we, we talked outwardly about those that are unfaithful. Let's talk about inwardly about unfaithfulness. What does God require of us until the return of the Lord? That we occupy until He comes spiritually. That we go into all the world and preach the gospel. That we make disciples of all nations. That we're salt and light. Now, all hell is breaking loose in America in the world right now. And we have evangelical churches that are circuses. They're not, they're a wall in the spiritual battle. 
They've sold out. They're compromised. But there exists a faithful remnant of God's people, perhaps in the tens of millions in the U.S. alone. And I would say the majority of the people in this room are part of that faithful remnant. God in biblical history, and repeated with the fact that there were only 12 disciples who turned the Roman Empire upside down by the power of God and brought down Rome spiritually, and the fact that in the Old Testament, Gideon's band, and time after time, God saved by a few and not by many. God does not need superior numbers to win the spiritual battle. He needs a remnant that's on fire for him. So, and this is the purpose of the book Mass Awakening. Mass Awakening deals with revival and a spiritual awakening. I will be talking on that in another session about awakening, spiritual awakening in light of the last days in another session. And then I'll also be talking about uh, not only mass awakening, but the biography of the devil, which sounds like a very heavy topic during the banquet lunch session. You've got to sign up for that. I'll be speaking at that. But I'm going to tie in the biography of the devil into Babylon and what's going on currently in the last days. And it will be something that you will be able to eat your lunch with at the same time. Okay? <laughs> Because <laughs> I'm painfully aware that, that, that you've got to have lunch. You know. So, what is our responsibility? What is our responsibility? To be the faithful bride of Christ in the last days. Is faithfulness contingent upon a record of 100% perfection on your part or my part? Amen. You, you smart group. Is, I don't have to ask the same question. I already got that. So, so our faith in, in the power of God, our faith in the Word of God, our faith in Christ's ability to make us righteousness. Because we're righteous by faith, not by performance. That's why even if we do sin, and I'm not saying you should sin, but we all sin daily. And anybody who doesn't think that daily sinning is, is well, you, you just don't. You need to get on your knees and ask God to show you all your sin. Because the longer you walk with Christ, the more you realize that you've got a lot of sins. Now, I don't go around depressed and, and morbid and oppressed. I bring it to Jesus. I accept his forgiveness by the blood of the Lamb, receive his uh, righteousness, my faith, and ask him to be the author and finisher of my salvation and change me. If I'm struggling with sins, and I struggle with all kinds of sins, I say, God, help me in this area. I can't do it. That means I'm trying, when I say that, that means I'm no longer trying to save myself. He's the author of my, uh, of my salvation, not me. I don't defeat my flesh and sin struggles with my willpower. Talk about being in a quicksand hot tub. You're going down, and I don't know about quicksands and hot tubs, but I wouldn't want to suffocate with a bunch of sand in my mouth. Put your faith in Christ. He is the solid rock. Upon the solid rock, I... Uh, I stand, all other is sinking sand. So what's, what's, the, what's the message for the church today in light of these crazy prophetic events? Sex with androids and robots will be the norm in the future. That didn't surprise me. I was a 15-year-old male one time. I had a very active imagination. I knew that was coming because I was reading sci-fi books. Virtual sex, that's already on the market. Big goggles and headphones, and you can do anything. Okay, um, you know, all kinds of stuff. Living forever, ever, genetic engineering, all these technologies, surveillance technology, drones delivered, delivering your pizza. Um, your 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 new the new uh, generation of uh, flat screen TVs spies on you now. Cameras on. If you notice a particular search engine, watch your laptop or computer carefully. When a little camera light lights up, the camera icon lights up, you're being recorded. Not necessarily uh, uh, specifically, just for megadata purposes, or for selling your facial reactions to products and services uh, brought up on the screen. So like you see a can of Budweiser and you've got a big smile, the computer picks that up. I'm not joking. Uh, the little microphone comes on on your uh, laptop. They're record recording constantly your voice. How do we know this? Because hackers, people have big screens, 
in their bedroom. Hackers have gone into the system, and uh, uh, you know, married couples do what married couples do, and uh, it ends up on the internet because a guy hacked into their big screen. People don't know it. That's just the beginning of the technology. Just the beginning. So, how do we remain victorious? Well, the first thing that we under have to understand that our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and dark unseen forces of wickedness in heavenly places. If we are going to attempt to win the battle with fleshly human means, we're going to lose. The only way we can win the battle is through spiritual weapons from the Word of God and the Kingdom of God. For the weapons of our warfare are spiritual and mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power and love and a sound mind. The power of God. That doesn't mean, the power of God does not mean you have to be a psychotic in desperate need of medication, rolling on the floor, barking like a dog, doing somersaults. That is an aberration of the power of God. The power of God expressed in King David he was an administrator, a warrior, a poet, a lyricist. Power of God moving in Paul's life. He was all kinds of things. The power of God expresses itself in a multiplicity of natural gifts and spiritual gifts. But we have to abide. This is what was burning in my heart to share with you. Jesus is calling us today at this conference. Today. He's calling us now at this moment, at this second. Jesus is calling us. And he's telling us that we need to abide in him as he abides in us. Because apart from him, we can do nothing. If we are separated from our union with Jesus, we shrivel up very quickly. We're powerless. We can't do what we were created to do because we don't have the strength to do it. So we have to abide in Jesus as he abides in us. And then Jesus says, then when you do that, ask me whatever you will, and I'll do it for you. And then he says things like, nothing is impossible with God. I had the privilege of working with Dr. Bill Bright very early in my career in ministry, and he taught me this lesson. He was the founder of Campus Crusade for Christ. He said, think supernaturally and act supernaturally. Don't just act and think like, well, what can Paul McGuire do by himself? What can Paul McGuire do as he's in union and connection with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? So you are facing both personal struggles and challenges, but you are also facing uh, great spiritual battles in our nation. To the degree that you and I choose to abide in Jesus and we allow Him to abide in us, the supernatural power of God flows out of our lives. The power to ask God, and He answers in prayer. The power to uh, withstand the forces of evil. The power to spiritually occupy until He comes. A remnant that is infused with power from on high can turn a numerically mighty army back if the remnant is on fire with the power of God. That's what a great awakening is about. I'll be talking about that. Now people say, you can't have a great awakening. It's the last days. Look, man, something happened to you when you were born. You either fell on your head or your mother dropped the Bible on your head, the King James one with the leather, and it bent your cerebral abilities. It has been the last days since the time of the Apostle Paul, and we had a revival called the Reformation. We had the first Great Awakening, the second Great Awakening. We've had revivals in the last days. Just because the Bible is replete with scriptures about counterfeit revivals and false teachers and false apostles, and false signs and wonders and false moves of God that they will increase in the last days, and they are increasing in the last days, doesn't mean that God suddenly became impotent and can't send power on His people. Because if you and I can't accomplish anything without His power, we need His power. So you and I will be victorious in the private matters of our life and in the larger matters to the degree that we rely on the Lord. And that simply means don't buy into the levels, the devil's lie that you're not worthy. None of us are worthy. That's why if we were worthy, we wouldn't need a Savior. 
Of course we're not worthy. That's why Jesus came. But He made us worthy. And we receive His worthiness by faith. And that gives us the ability to come boldly to the throne of grace to find an ever-present help in time of need. So we move from whining and complaining and victimhood and shell shock is that we go into the throne room of God by faith, and it should begin today, and lay hold of God who is eagerly waiting to give us the resources we need to be victorious. Can I pray just briefly? Would you join me in prayer? Lord Jesus Christ, I thank you for this prophecy convention. I thank you for every person here and every person watching around the world. And Lord, we are your faithful remnant by faith. And you watching on your TV screen or whatever, you're part of that faithful remnant, or the Holy Spirit would not have caused you to watch this conference from Prophecy in the News. Lord, a remnant can turn the tide. We ask, Father, in the name of Jesus, that the spirit of truth would be released in each one of our hearts and minds, that you would give us your power, that you would supernaturally fortify us with your power, that you would renew your, our minds with the Word of God, give us the mind of Christ, and let us think supernaturally and act supernaturally. And Father, we were not called to go AWOL on the spiritual battle in America until you return. So up to the last minute until you return, we are to occupy until you come. And we covenant with you now, at this moment, that we just speak personally to the Lord. Lord, I covenant with you that I am going to occupy until you come, Lord. I ask you to fill me with your power to make me faithful. I choose to stand for righteousness and love, and I choose to be part of a faithful remnant. And Lord God, use us together to turn back the tide of evil. And may there be, Lord, according to your judgment and precepts, may, may there be some kind of revival and we plead the blood on America and repent as intercessors because we have become, in the church and outside of the church, guilty of abominations. We repent of it, God, but give us a revival that's biblical, and we ask to whatever degree you are willing to grant it, turn the tide, Lord Jesus. For the enemy com comes in, comma, like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against them. You are that standard. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus.